<laughs> Hello and welcome to the Real Life History Podcast, a podcast where the four of us today discuss history for a bit over an hour. Today's episode is about the scramble for Africa, which begins in the 19th century, late 19th century, and goes until the colonization. So first of all, should we begin with a short news segment of the things that happened over the last few weeks with Peter, or the last few days? Well, um, first off, thank you, Cam. The Alger, the not the Algerian, sorry, the Afghan uh, vice president survives a second assassination attempt, escaping unarmed after an attack killed one of his bodyguards in the northern of the country. Um, the attack was claimed by the Taliban. It lasted an hour. Um, a month a month ago, fourteen people died in a suicide bombing at the Kabul airport shortly after the arrival of the Afghan um, vice president, and it was claimed by the Islamic State. The attack was claimed by the Islamic State. Um, wait, I thought, wait, is did the Taliban or the Is Islamic State do it? Um, the Taliban did this one, but then the one at the airport was claimed by the Islamic State. Ah, okay, all right. You mean the massive yeah. bombing? Yeah, fourteen yeah. people died. Jeez. You want to you want to move on? Hmm. He he's it turns out that he he oh sorry is my thing cracking up? No, no it's okay. Okay, it turns out that he's an ethnic ethnic Uzbek and and he wants to appeal to the Uzbek voters in the north of the country and he's a former warlord as well. So he was an ally of the uh of the Americans and that's probably why he's an enemy of the Taliban yeah. now. Yeah. I feel like you know, hmm. even even though the relations have been like, I guess, getting better with the Taliban and the US due to the ongoing negotiations, they don't really like each other that much. I think I think that's just like a statement from the Taliban saying because he was a US supporter. Yeah, uh, like they 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 want US to like completely go and they want US influence to completely go. That's probably a statement they're trying. To make. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, there's probably gonna be some purges by the Taliban after if they, you know, take if I take control after the U.S. withdrawals. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. So the next story. Um. China's been building bases in Antarctica. The um forty-two percent of Antarctica has been claimed by Australia as a sovereign territory, and Antart and, um sorry Australia does have research stations on the Antarctic coast. Um, total. There's a total of eighty separate facilities open in in um Antarctica, and China is. However, China is currently building its fifth station on Antarctica, even though it has not secured environmental approval. Um. However, we really don't know what the Chinese are doing at Antarctica. All we know is that China is interested in expanding and building its bases all over the the, um, the almost yeah. mostly unclaimed continent hmm. Hmm. so you said there was a fifth are they are they all like located around so yeah um, they they have, they're located all over wait, wait. the place they've got three in the australian territories and then they have one in the new zealand territory which is getting built right now and then they have the great wall one which is on the other side near chile oh, okay well to be fair since Antarctica is terra nullis, and no one really recognizes the claims. That people... I don't necessarily think there's a problem because it's more than easy enough for China to argue no one has claim to this territory, therefore we have the right to build on there, right? As long as it's scientific, yeah. which <clears throat> I'm pretty sure is like within international law, right? I think that's mm. fair enough. Nobody's actually. Well, I mean, Australia just started picking up on their like. Um... How would you put it? Like they check all these bases to make sure that they're okay because they're within their section of the land, but they haven't checked China's in so long because they're so um, remote and the Chinese don't necessarily let them in oh, sometimes. Yeah. So that's why they're feeling a bit threatened by it. Yeah, I guess yeah. that's fair enough. I mean, and of course we we aren't really quite sure why you know the Chinese is building a fifth base. It, yeah. it's, it's 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 all sort of re really mysterious, you know. Why would Ch China be interested in the Antarctic for you know, resources? Probably, but currently, I think we that, aren't really that sure. I think that yeah, it could be to do with the resources. It also could be just like 
China is just trying to spread their influence as much as possible at this time, like at this moment, you know, in this year and in the previous years. And this is just another way of them doing that. It's sort of just like disrespecting other nations and saying we can do what we want in a way, you know? So yeah, I think, I think no... it's just them trying to spread influence more than necessarily. Um, and there's no way Australia is going to object. Yeah, obviously not, because biggest trade what... partner. Yeah, what are they going to do? Yeah, exactly. So I guess this could be, you know, summarized as more of like an opportunist move where they could do something just because, you know, yeah, it's possible. exactly. Yeah, they're just showing the fact that they can do something to, you know, shows the influence they have, etc. All right. I mean, um, obviously, I think they could still be using it for like research purposes, obviously as well. But you know, I think there's I can't an really imagine that. how like a, a sufficient military base could work in the Antarctic. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Although you say that, but then the Russians have like really high Arctic bases and stuff. Like, yeah, but, I can, like, but I can see the Arctic. Uh, but but like, I can see the Arctic it's... bases because the Arctic base has been hit Alaska and over the other side into Canada. I mean, well, you, you know Franz Josef Land, which is like really far north. That that is like I'm pretty sure they have, they've got 17 military personnel. The Russians on, so it's like, you know. Yeah, but. You can still have a military Antarctica base Antarctica is, like, way further. I, I, well, I mean, the Russians. I, think, I think Franz Josef Land is, like, really far up. Like, it's it's on, it's on next to the top of Greenland, basically, I think. But I, I think, Antar obviously, depends how far inland they're building the bases in Antarctica. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Hmm. But yeah. there's no point, really, having a military base there because it's like, what are you going to protect? <laughs> That that's true. What are you protecting? What are you actually like? Yeah. So. All right. Um. Are you ready to talk about the um the twelve year old who can lift one hundred and twenty pounds? No. <laughs> oh my god. Twelve year old that can lift. Oh my god. I mean, since Peter's brought it up, we might as well discuss it. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't even watched the video. Oh my it, god. Wait. What? Which? Which news? Um. A BBC. It's on the BBC. I love, I just, I love it when news people just make stupid articles just to like, you know, just, just for the sake, it seems like they're just trolling half the time. Yeah. They're they can lift 120. Yeah, I see it. Does it, does it, does it matter? Damn. She's not even like buff or anything. She's like skinny. It's impressive. Okay. I think we don't need to All talk right. about this. Apparently she's been training <laughs> seven years old. Damn. Jesus. To, to Brooklyn live. Sitna dreams of going to the CrossFit Games in 2019. Damn. That's intense. Okay. Anyway. All right, so um, let's get Important started. News. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, um, so before we actually get into um, the Scrum for Africa, just some, some quick context about the topic and uh, what we're going to discuss. So, you know, before, like, the 1870s, Africa hasn't really been colonized. In, in the beginning of the 19th century, very little bit of Africa has actually been taken over by the Western colonial empires, um, as the Europeans were not interested until the late you know, 19th century, where the amount of resources and potential that Africa held became more apparent as time and technology improved. Um, mm. However, the, uh, the Portuguese were actually the first to establish any sort of contact in the coast of West Africa, and they actually formed trading ports and fortifications as early in the um, the 15th century. So, um, would anyone like to just start off by contextualizing they, they about what the Portuguese had, um, did? They also had a significant amount of like land, surprisingly, in like Mozambique, in modern day. Mozambique. If you look at um that sort of part, like southern Mozambique, they had they had a decent amount of land mm -hmm. there. Um, I think obviously mostly trading ports. Actually, other than I think the trading posts were like all across the African coast, like even up into like Mombasa and like even further up to the Horn of Africa and like mm -hmm. all, all the way around. So like, even though, I don't know, the, the Portuguese sort of pioneered that in a way. They, they, um, yeah, but obviously the, other than the Portuguese and the Spanish in the North, the colonization started basically due to the Berlin Conference. Yeah. Although, actually, when um, did the Cape Colony? Was the Cape Colony before? The I think Cape it was. Colony, the, the Cape Colony was 
a tiny bit earlier, but it was the the yeah. scramble did actually just kick off with Leopold at the the Berlin conference as a result of yeah. that. But yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And we talked about it in our episode where the Portuguese was one of the longest lasting empire who pioneered a lot of exploration techniques. So it really shouldn't be a surprise here that they were one of the first to establish sort of contact mm -hmm. around the African coast. Yeah. But one of the main reasons why Africa hasn't really been colonized for so long is because no one actually went ahead and mapped it. No one really bothered to do like an exploration of inland Africa and just to see like, you know, what, what the hell is even in there. So for, for a good like 50 years or the African continent has really been left in a state of just, I guess, yeah. unknowing. Um, the Europeans didn't really know what, what was on the African well, continent. Well, the Portuguese mapped the coastlines. Yeah. They did, they did pretty good in terms of mapping the coastlines, but yeah, no one, no one went inland. No one. No one. Um, there actually were like not even that many former states in the inland. We only had like a couple along the coast of more fertile yeah, region. Yeah, West Africa had a lot. Um, West Africa, you know, things like Mali and Songhai and yeah, all that were like the only. And then obviously you had in like Ethiopia. Other than that, it was just tribal pretty much. And then the Congo, obviously, the Kingdom of the Congo was. Mm -hmm. there. So, one of the first people who um actually went ahead and explored the the inland of africa and did just so much contributing to the ability for um colonization and exploration as well was um david livingstone he was a missionary who was accepted into the london missionary society in 1838 um he originally wanted to go for to china as his you know missionary work However, the opium wars made that impossible, so he decided that it would make sense for him to go to Africa. Um, he arrived at Cape Town June 31st, 1848, deciding to spread the gospel in the untried regions of the north, wanting to do so through the natives as a conduit instead of just being sort of direct um, interactions with sort of his messengers. By 1842, Livingstone has gone further north in the, um, the Kalahari region, than any other European, and in just a year, he was able to familiarize himself with the local languages and cultures. Um, during a journey to Mabotsa in 1844, he was quiet, obviously. He married Mary Mafat, who was the daughter of the person who got him into this whole missionary business. And Livingstone obviously had a lot of achievements. You know, the first psych. Lake Nagami was awarded by the World Geography Society. He decided that initially British region of South Africa, he was going to move on 11th November 1853. He went, he went up wanting to open up the interior of Africa and complete one of his major goals, which was to undercut the slave trade. To do so, he tried to discover a route to the Atlantic. He, unlike other explorers, one of the key traits of Livingstone's expeditions was that he didn't bring that many soldiers, and all he did was travel lightly, brought a couple, you know, African servants and assistants with him, which avoided a problem that other explorers had, where the locals mistook them for slavers, slave traders, and just came in and attacked them. Livingstone's preaching was also quite distinct. He never forced it on unwilling years when he preached his Christian messages. And he was able to negotiate passage with local chiefs as he understood their local traditions. Mm. And Livingstone had discovered Victoria Falls on May 20th, 1856, named it after the Queen and when he Queen Victoria, and when he returned to England on the 9th of December, 1856, he was revered as a national hero striking up you know, intense interest about yeah. the exploration of Africa. And that is really how the first of the um the African explorations really started off was due to Livingstone's exploit. He later tried to continue north with more support for private bodies to um try to find the source to explore for Zambezi and then later yeah. find the source of the Nile. However, during during this explore 
during his um, Zambesi exploration, although it failed due to poor organization, the fact that he couldn't what, go up this river, um, his prestige was, you know, impaired. However, the scientific knowledge gathered on the failed trip was nevertheless um, quite important. And Livingstone later spent the, the rest of his life searching for the source of the Nile. And he um, eventually died in Africa on one of his exploits where he met Henry Morton Stanley, another very important explorer, which we'll touch on later. Hmm. Yeah, I always find it amazing how, like, how much um, influence like missionaries actually have exploration and coming into contact with these new places. Like if you look at Japan as well, that's another prime example of missionaries mm-hmm. on having an effect. And obviously Livington, that's it, Livington. It's actually, I think that's pretty amazing. And the, um, the American Philippines too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's so, pretty cool. He, he I, was I, I, pretty significant at, like, having a uh, effect on like Africa and like, you know, European, um, knowledge of Africa. He was yeah. pretty significant. He's he's one of the first uh, uh, people to, to decide to just go out into the African continent. Yeah. Uh, I suppose regarding the point about missionaries is that they are more or less the more human aspect of the whole expeditionary force. And yeah, they're usually true. the pioneers of the Western ideas, both new and old, and in that case they were able to easily integrate into the society and ingrain themselves into the culture of the locals yeah and i think the fact that he wasn't enforcing on his um preachings um, made his job a whole lot easier because like you you see especially in the americas you see a lot of um missionaries that were quite forceful in their um conversion yeah. which he, led to backlash from the natives he actually got along really well with with the natives which is another state that really surprised yeah. me quite a bit um, you want to move on? Yeah. Livingstone was obviously one of the pioneers for African exploration, and it almost triggered interest in Britain regarding Africa. However, on, on, on the European mainland, King Leopold II of Belgium had his own plans regarding what he wanted to do with Africa, and he did so through an explorer named Henry Morton Stanley. Leopold previously chaired the International African Association, and he had interests in using the International African Association as a philanthropic guise so he could sort of civilize, with air quotes, um, the African region and take it over himself. He, 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 He got Henry Morton Stanley to explore the Congo Basin region doing extensive research around it and what ended up happening was he was able to get all of these chieftains to sort of just sign treaties that the chieftains didn't know what they were signing when they signed it the chieftains were like oh we're going to receive some gifts but then it actually annexed all of their territory so leopold was able to get 450 of these treaties just annexing little chieftains left and right, and by the late 1880s, he was able to gain a, wa- a vast um, swath of land around the Congo, which he claimed. And he later founded the International Congo Association, which we'll receive. Which we'll, wait, um, wait, I, well, my, well, I have one question about the treaties. Were they actually, yeah. like, they weren't in the native languages, were they? I'm not I sure. Um, either I way, I don't... Yeah, but either way, I, I think... The chieftains, they never signed things like this, so they didn't know what they were reading. And it could have been worded as a way to make it yeah, seem like true. the chieftains weren't annexing their land. Yeah, even if it was, it was still pretty sick the way they did it. Yeah. Um, either way, the chieftains were just, and the local leaders were just rock blind. Um, so Leopold founded the International Congo Association called the ICA. Um, it was initially supposed to be a philanthropy philanthropic um, organization for humanitarian purposes in the Congo. However, he bought off the investors and had secret plans for just mass colonization. And the uh, the French actually discovered what Leopold was doing. They got quite scared that Leopold was going to start expand across Africa. And 
the French moved really quickly to seize portions of Africa using um, a naval officer called Pierre de Braza to found Brazzaville in 1881. And he the French secured Tunisia, Guinea, and the Republic of Congo today by 1884. Meanwhile, Portugal was able to use old treaties with the church and with um, the Spanish Empire, as well as through its proxy known as the Congo Empire, to, to restart its co colonial efforts. Um, a treaty was formed between Britain and Portugal that blocked off the Congo, the ICA's access to the Atlantic. Meanwhile, Italy joined the Triple Alliance, which forced Bismarck's Germany, which didn't want to get involved into Africa, to actually get involved. Meanwhile, um, Britain also took over Egypt in 1884 to keep control of the Suez Canal to um, keep hold of the trade routes. As the nation started going into Africa and grabbing up land, um, Otto von Bismarck decided to call the Berlin Conference, which they mostly dis they discussed about slavery, and most of the European nations nominally agreed that slavery needed to be abolished in Africa. And the Berlin Conference mostly were about rules regarding colonization, you know, regulations for governing superpowers who wanting to look for colonies in Africa. No country yeah. may occupy a region without stating their intentions. And a nation can only claim a, a part of territory if they formally occupy it. The mm. the Congo region was recognized was recognized well as part of Leopold's, you know, claim. Leopold's claim was recognized. However, it was recognized on on the principles that Leopold would use his Congo region to improve the state of living for the late this a sort of natives and sort of build up as a, as a actual state. Um the Berlin conference was important as it ensured there won't be war to break out between the natives as the European superpowers didn't really want to go to war in Africa and it would be kind of corrupt productive and still be fighting a two front war against each other and the natives. With the Berlin Conference, this was really how the uh the scramble for Africa has kicked off. Yeah. I I always I always find like the um the, the, the Congo is one of the like sickest parts of like the, the history of like Europeans in Africa because like the way Leopold set it out in such a malicious like way, he put it under the guise of like being, you know, humanitarian, and we're going to go in here in this region that's extremely hard to enter, and we're going to set up humanitarian aid and make it a better place. And then he just turns into a corporate state, and like the horror stories that have come out of the Congo, like you basically using hands as currency because whenever yeah, someone they did, wouldn't they pay did their taxes, they cover. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the rubber was so insanely, the quota was so insane that. No one paid it, so then they ended up just using hands as currency, which is the most like sick thought ever. It's just like yeah, ugh, it, it was so unbelievably disgusting what happened in the Congo, and I yeah. guess it could attribute to Leopold's ability to deceive the Europeans, since most of them were at least ready to enter Africa with some sort of initiative in helping the natives, and they all agreed yeah. that it was gonna help. It it was gonna be a helpful thing, but then Leopold twisted the whole thing into something that's completely yeah. disgusting. It, it's always like interesting to wonder, like the Congo today, the Democratic Republic of Congo, isn't a great place. Like it's still no. pretty violent. And I wonder how much of that is actually attributed to the fact that the Belgians did such like well, I wouldn't say the Belgians, but more the, that Leopold did such horrific things there, right? It's like well I wonder actually how much it it, is, like, it literally but I guess we could say that Due to the mass killings, you know, almost so some estimate to fifty percent of the population, the Congo was set back like one or two generations with no political infrastructure. So they were already so behind by the time World War One and World War Two started. And yeah. afterwards, with the quick independence wars that occurred throughout Africa, Congo, I guess just the R Congo just went out without any sort of infrastructural construction because what the Europeans' power did to it was so devastating. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the stuff I was just reading in the Congo is 
absolutely horrific from Leopold. It is. It really oh, my is. My God. It's just, yeah. it's like unhuman, the sort of things he Yeah. Did. And the fact that so many people actually like collaborated with him and went for it mm-hmm. because like profit yeah. incentives. Yeah. Exactly. The, um, I mean, the Berlin Conference was supposed to be colonial, but at least they did it. Even they didn't expect that when they started off, it was going to get this bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so the Ber- Berlin Conference had pretty much kicked off Leopold's initiative to take over sort of the Congo for himself. There's an important distinction that we have to make here. The Belgian government didn't run the Congo. It was yeah, the exactly. Congo region. The, corporate state. the Congo, yeah, the Congo Free State, as they called it, was Leopold's personal property. Yeah, and like it that. was under his sole dictatorship. He could do whatever he wanted. Now, this is actually interesting because the Belgian government didn't seem to care about what their king was doing, even though they had the power to intervene. Yeah, I was, re- I was yeah. actually reading um, like ages ago the fact that um, the, 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 what happened in the Belgian Congo, I, this might be wrong, it's been a while since I read it, but like, they don't teach it very well in schools in Belgium. They sort of like um, gloss over it. Mm-hmm. And they don't really go into the fact that it would turn into such a like a horrific event, even though it was like a significant part of like Belgian history, at least colonial wise. No, because yeah. I always found that pretty interesting. The fact that like sort of gloss over it. So. Well, mm. I suppose that could do to Leopold's direct line is currently still the Belgian royalty. Yeah, exactly. They don't want to taint it, but like, yeah. Well, no, no, I don't think it's his direct line. I think his. Since he didn't have any children, any male oh. children, yeah. it's like his brother's uh, line. But yeah, I don't oh, really yeah, think they want right. to, you know, bring disrepute upon the monarchy. Yeah. Um. So how did Leopold actually get these states to support him? How, how did how did he get them to agree that um you know the Belgian or the Belgian king should control the Congo? First think... off, he. Oh okay. Uh, no, Cam, you go. Well, I mean, like, from from what I remember, didn't he, didn't he, you, he used that, that Congo Association thing to sort of, like, yeah. he used that with his buying off everyone to sort of, like, get influence with other European powers to think, you know what, I'm going to do some good here, we have the capacity to do some good, and he didn't at all mention the fact he was going to exploit the region, and then, yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly what he did. Um, he he offered Fred the French some support. Hmm. He, but I mean, on top of that, can can you just imagine one person controlling all of that and like the horrific degree that he did it to? I mean, like I know that the British kind of had that in the Raj with like their crown colony in a way, but yeah. like Leopold himself controlled the entire Congo and just. Like, you know, at, by that point in European history, they'd all instituted, like, parliamentary reforms and things like that, so there was more democracy and less absolute dictatorships or monarchies. Yes. But, like, it's almost like a new absolute monarchy just in Africa, but it's done by the Europeans. And it's arguable that it's even more backwards than some of the, um, yeah. the earlier autocracies that existed during the time because there was absolutely no rule of law within the Congo. Exactly. Um, one of the things that I was reading is that I actually have no clue why the Belgians even allowed their king to do this. Yeah. Th- does it, does anyone else know why? I don't. I don't yeah, know if I've they got... had too much choice. Like I don't know if they yeah. were public too much about it and like publicized it. You know, I don't think they. But had it to, became but such a. But it became such a massive source for ivory and rubber later on. The the Belgian government yeah. surely knew what. But I'm not sure if like. Yeah, I don't even think the profits went to the Belgian government. I think they might have just gone straight in, into the pocket yeah, of the king. They got they, they went into the king. And then the government was like too afraid to speak out, I I think, you know, against their king because I obviously he has the power to dismiss them. Like, or maybe they just didn't know. I I think the Congo was such a remote extent, region. Yeah, that's true. I think to an extent some of them might have known, but I don't think it would have been widely known because I think mm, they would have kept yeah. it under wraps. Because obviously yeah. it was a separate country; it was his own corporate state. 
as opposed to um <laughs> ignore the cat as opposed to um you know as a, a colony a crown colony of the um of the belgian yeah. kingdom there isn't really an example of like that in history that i can think of anywhere else though like a corporate state that's ruled by the monarch basically yeah I don't think so. I, I don't think so either. Like I don't. And existing that. within a parliamentary democracy makes it just all the yeah, more exactly. weird. Mm. It is odd. And and it, what's is, is there a story behind how it's got that tiny little, um, how do I put this, like, appendage which, which sticking out of it, getting to the Atlantic? Oh, I think I don't know. Uh, like I guess I think it followed the river basically. Uh, and okay. then they wanted, because obviously you see it follows the northern border, followed the Congo River. Yeah. And then the Portuguese, I think, had the coastline, and then they might have come to some sort of deal, probably, to get like river access. Mm. And at, at that point, Leopold was using the Portuguese's record of slavery, and he also had support from the French, where he promised, where he, he supported the French claim on the Congo Northern Bank and said that yeah. if himself he didn't have the money he would revert back to french support which the french agreed because they said there was no way this one guy even though he was the king of belgium had enough money to to add it he also had support from president arthur in the usa who he sent in actually you know edited and abridged copies of the annexation treaties to sort of swindle or keep the um That's the u.s president and he made him believe that this was similar to what was going on in Liberia, which was an independent African state that the uh, U.S. Yeah. helped set up for the African slaves. And President Arthur sort of just said, yeah, this is fine, and we got supported. And that's how, with France and the U.S. behind him, Leopold was able to convince the Germans and the British to give him the Congo. Hmm. Hmm. Um, but what did Leopold actually promise um so we're going to move on to leopold's initial promises some of the problems he faced with the congo region and what his solutions were so he promised to suppress the slave trade and promote humanitarian policies in the congo he guaranteed um free trade with 20 years of zero percent import duties and another important thing which was one of his earliest decrees was that the congo free state we're just going to bring you to the cfs here had the right to own and take every bit of vacant land which was uninhabited or unclaimed in the Congo region, in the borders of the CFS. Now, since the vast majority, over 90%, I suppose, of the Congo was uninhabited, the CFS was able to use this claim and make almost the entirety of the Congo Free State of its territory state-owned land. and what happened was the Congo Free State ordered all of the natives to hand over all their produce of rubber and ivory to the state, basically leaving them with almost nothing since they were living on state out land. This was yeah. one of the first things that he did to um to give to to sort of start exploiting the populace and form a state owned monopoly. Um, any ivory or rubber that was in that land belonged to the state, and since the only outlet of products like daily goods and stuff was from the state in the Congo region, a state-controlled monopoly was created where the prices could be adjusted, and the Congo, the, lo the native Congo people received almost nothing for their work. Yeah, it's like, like we said earlier; it's pretty horrific, and the, the things and, that, yeah. that led. I mean, you'd think that he might have used, you know, the money to you know, flood it back to Belgium or for his own personal gain, but apparently he used so much of it to fund and give gifts to his mistresses and friends and favorites, at, you know, in the country and just squandered it, basically. It's like he committed all these horrific acts and it wasn't even like to any measurable benefit to even Belgium or the Congo or anything useful. Yeah, I do remember reading. Yeah, it, it was pretty much a giant waste mm. of resources and, and and lives for nothing. But my question is, was he properly like educated? Like, I I don't remember, but I think that king might have been a bit um, 
I don't know if I remember reading something about him being a, like a bit, I don't know, wrong in the head earlier. <laughs> like, you know. Uh, no, yeah, there's no doubt. Da- there's no doubt that the king, the king was pretty pretty deranged, but I'd assume yeah. that. I'd assume that he had um, had some understanding of what he was doing. Sort of the mentality that if I keep this under the rug, then the Belgian government doesn't come and take care of this, and you know the British doesn't really find out. Then I guess he hoped that it'll all be all right. I always think that like the problem with people born into monarchs is they can either one, but be an all right. You know they can strive to be like a a good monarch, like Queen yeah. Elizabeth, for example. Or on the other hand, they can completely abuse their power and just like go, oh, I've been given divine right by God to like, you know, to to, to rule over this land. Therefore, I'm going to use that right, even though, you know, it's just like completely me- uh, <laughs> mental to think that way. But that's just yeah. the way they did. Hmm. I suppose the Congo Free State would be an examination of extreme oppression under an autocracy and what that meant especially placed in with the technology and ambitions of a modern day well post-industrial revolution european colonial power yeah well of course um you know th- there were problems as in a lot of problems when leopold started off his his little pet project um yeah. first off he when he started off, he didn't have money, so right off the bat, he owned a lot of debt, and he was risking his Congo region to lose to the Belgian government, which is why he imposed the the state. He took all of the land for the state, and why, and why he um he started exploiting the natives to make to sort of make back the money so that he could continue owning it. Um, he also cooperated with some of the local elites. Who took advantage? Who took advantage um, of Leopold's need for allies and imposed massive tax rates yeah. on the um, on the locals to exploit them further? Um, there was also this pretty interesting, I guess, funny thing regarding the Berlin Conference. There, there was a principle called effective occupation, where if you had a treaty with a local leader or you flew a flag, or you established an administration for police around a coastal region, right? You could, the colonizer could pretty much just use this bit of land economically. However, due to the fact that the treaty at the Berlin Conference didn't specify how much of that land was, because would be, you know, the coastal land that they were able to claim, you know, to what extent. Yeah of the coastal region. Also the fact that with the treaties with local chiefs, the borders in the African regions were not well defined. What ended up happening was Britain had control of the Cape colonies and they were able to use this loophole of of ambiguity to claim absolutely huge regions of South Africa as a result of that. And yeah. by that time the British were using this principle to move up into um the southern Congo region. Also, um, Arab slavers and local African warlords still controlled the Congo, um, the Congo interior. Well, what did Leopold decide to do with these problems? In 1892, there were decrees in the Congo region, in which case, after he was just bleeding, bleeding cash with the whole state of land business, he was able to give these private domains to concessional companies which gave them the private right to extract rubber and he leopold gave away a large regions of state-owned land to these concession companies and um private companies who weren't given their own land could work in leopold's regions but they were taxed to death um the companies could pay, could detain Africans who didn't work hard enough and police their regions, and the companies could obviously take all of the produce for themselves. However, however, um, the concession you know, companies had to pay an you know, annual dividend, which to Leopold, 
and with this cycle of working with the companies and earning their pay while the companies taking away most of the resources, Leopold was able to continuously fund and fill the royal coffers. Mm. Um, so that was actually the start of Leopold's cooperations with these private industries and the further um, increase of all of the horrors that we've heard about the CFS, the Congo Free State, because not, now not only there was Leopold, but there were all of these other external elements who are willing to come in and start exploiting the Congo people for their own gains. Mm. Mm. Um, so another thing regarding um okay pause pause right here yeah okay do you have time yeah do you, do you have time? time do you have a lot mm. of time well how do much longer have... well i'm i'm wrapping i'm gonna wrap up and then move on to do you have 30 minutes or 40 minutes yeah Sure. Uh, Do you have an additional of that? 30 to 40 minutes. Debatable. Debatable? Well, we're at the 45 minutes. Let's just leave it till 30. Like we try to keep these. Well, yeah, but we try to keep these to about an hour, don't we? Yeah, well, do you mind if I go a little bit over? Is that... Do you have time? Technically, yes. Yeah, to like 30 minutes. Can you do that? Yeah. yeah. Well, how much more do you want to discuss? Well, how much more do you want to discuss, yeah. No, I want to discuss just... I guess I'll wrap up quickly on the Congo and I go up to the Boer Wars. Yeah, yeah. sure. Do you mind? Will, sure. Will, can you talk about the Boer Wars for a bit more? I think, uh, I feel like we should talk at some point about, like, the actual, um, divvying up of land. You know, who, which, who got who? Who got what, I mean. You know? Yeah, if you can bring up a... want to skip the Boer Wars and come back to that in a, in a later episode? Mm. The Boer Wars are kind of related to this, though. They are, they are related. No, we actually well, going to talk about them. Like, we're going to go through this. the Boer Wars quickly then, and then move on to the land. Yeah, exactly, I agree. And then talk about, other than the Boer Wars, what else do you have? Boer Wars, and then we need to talk about who owns Oh, Boer. just the quick Morocco crisis so we can shit on the Kaiser some more, because everyone loves to do that. Okay, good. Yeah, okay. I'm up for that. And other than that, is that it? What? Yeah, so I'll just run through the Stairs Expedition and the, um, the Arab War, because this was all really important. Yeah, right. Peter, just run through the important stuff and you'll be fine. Just run through the most important stuff. I know, alright. Yeah. Do the ball. Alright, let's start. Right. Well said, right, Chai. Okay. Thank you. Start, start with Alright, um... There were two other major conflicts within the Congo region, which was involving with the, the scramble for Africa, sort of exempted what was happening. So... Meanwhile, um, the British South African Company and the CFS was battling for control in the southern Congo regions. And caught between these two was the Katamta Chief Missouri, whose land was unclaimed and comparable to a European state. Um, he rose to conquest, he rose to power through conquest and slavery, obviously. And although both both nations, the British and the Belgian, didn't have treaties in Missouri in Katanga and as news about the Katanga region having like gold and copper from the region. The, the, the efficiency loophole, which we talked about previously, opened for a massive free-for-all as the two countries brawled over the Katanga region. Uh, the Belgians said, hired a British explorer called William Grant Stairs to, um, to take Katanga. Um, Leopold ordered that they were to take over this region with, treat with a treaty, with persuasion, or with violence. However, if a British South African company if a British South African company arrived, took over the region before that, they would go back and wait for the orders. However, if the company came after they took over the region, um, the Belgian forces were to expel them verbally or by force. Um, by the time the Belgians had arrived, gifts were exchanged and they were negotiating some f form of treaty. However, Mr. during one of the, 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 the standoffs between the negotiations, Missouri was spying on the Belgian camp and later formulated a plan where he would where he would stall the negotiation until either the British arrived, in this case he could get out of it by having the two two the Belgian and the British forces exhaust themselves, right? Or he could wait for a five thousand man reinforcement to arrive. When the Belgians figured this out, an ultimatum was given to Missouri after Stairs rejected a hostage plan, proposed to capture one of Missouri's wives and sort of bring him to the table there. 
Missouri rejected the ultimatum and left for left for another fortified village called Manima. Stairs on behalf of the Belgians sent 100 African soldiers to capture Missouri, ended up slaughtering the entire village of Manima, and M Missouri was executed during the battle. The Katanga region was took over after that, with Leopold regarding it as a phenomenal success. Since the British lost the race, they quickly switched around their initiatives and decided and decided to um to instead invest heavily in the region. And some British actually considered Stairs was British, a traitor for assisting the Belgians in taking over Katanga instead of the uh helping the British. Um another story was the Congo Arab War, where the Belgians tried to persuade a Zanzibari slave warlord called Tipu Tip. He was Arabic. Um, they wanted to make him a they wanted to make him a state official who was governing of the Stanley Falls district, a region within the Belgian Congo. However, Tipu already had previous clashes. Huh? Yes. Sorry, sorry about that. Hello? What? What? Sorry about that. Um, mm -hmm. What's the problem? I heard something. Over the mic. Mm -hmm. Oh. It's okay. Does, does all of you have headphones on? Yes. Yeah. All of you have headphones on, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Alright, um... I'll just... I'll just go on from... I'll just keep going, right? Sorry about that. I. Doesn't matter. Like, go for it. <laughs> your, how's your ping 2k? Mate, that's nothing. Mine's been at like 20,000 Well, when it cuts out. I'm not even <laughs> kidding, it gets to 20,000. Yeah, yeah, it has. Mine has two, actually. Okay, I'm back. Alright, so I'm gonna keep going. Give me like, alright. A the couple problem, seconds of silence. Yeah, the thing with the ping there is it just, like, it froze Peter, so Peter was just harmonizing on one note for like four or five seconds straight, and then it finally cut. <laughs> Does anyone have objections to me playing Oblivion, or do I, or should I not? Yes, nice. yes. Don't. Don't? Okay, do you want to play? Do, don't play Oblivion. You, you can, can play, play Oblivion. You can play Mini Metro, just don't play that. Mini Metro? I'm stuck on St. Petersburg. I'm triggered. Alright, let's keep going. Before you continue with Roddy. Alright, yeah. anyway, let's continue. Let's continue. So, Tipu and his son was attacking the locals, right? There were some skirmishes, and eventually, what happened was a a mini war broke out between between the Arab and a coalition of Arab slave traders and Tipu Tip, who, despite being a government official as the governor of Zanzibar, didn't want to subjugate to the authority of the Belgians. Wait, wait, um, his name is Tipu Tip. His name is. They called him Tipu Tip. Yes. What does that mean? Does that mean anything specific, or...? That is good stuff. <laughs> tip, tip, tip. No, his, um, his real name is actually Hamad bin Muhammad bin Juma bin Rajet El Mujerbi. <laughs> I can see why they call him Tipu Tip. <laughs> can you say that again? <laughs> Hamad bin Muhammad bin Juma bin Rajet El Mujerbi. Wait, is it Muhammad bin Muhammad bin? <laughs> no, no, it's Hamad bin Muhammad bin. Oh, Hamad bin Muhammad. <laughs> It, it's okay. not like DJ Khaled, where it's Khaled, Muhammad Khaled. That's a good one, though. <laughs> oh my like god. Uh, oh, okay, here, here it is. He's called Tipu Tip because his guns made tip-tip noises when he went into the Chungu territory. I see. Interesting. So it's... Absolutely glorious name. <laughs> good stuff. Good. It, it's some good, strong Arabic naming. Anyway, let's continue. Um, anyway, the, the the war ended with a Congo victory. However, tens of thousands were killed, but the Arab slave traders, who opposed Leopold for quite a long time in the interior, were crushed. How did Leopold actually keep control of this region? He used something called the Force Publique, his basically his military police, where he we talked about this earlier, where he terrorized the population and tortured and slaughtered anyone who didn't meet the rubber quota. 
And to actually prove that the soldiers weren't wasting bullets, if you shot, if you used one bullet, you had to present it with a severed hand, which yeah, represented yeah. an execution. And if you didn't make the rubber quotas, right, you your hat you would be killed and your hand would be cut off. Technically, a hand right. was supposed to mean, yeah, hands were pretty much the currency. Technically, you were supposed to kill a person and take their hand. But sometimes, yeah. some some locals just gave up. The, some some of the police would cut off their hand and leave the locals to live. Or sometimes the locals didn't meet the rubber quotas and they would have to get their hands ha- cut off as a punishment. Yeah, it's, it's so sick. Uh, Why yeah. is it inhumane? It's kind of brain dead hell. If you want to get the most out of them, but then you cut <laughs> yeah, off yeah. their hands so they can't even work. It just breaks the whole system. And because they made the quotas so high that no one could actually fulfill them. <laughs> exactly. It's like, you, you, you cut off the hand and you lose more people, which leads to less rubber. Yeah, it's exactly. so dumb. It's, it's like the whole thing of genocide. Like, why are you cleansing the entire population? You know, just... There's, there's no way you can justify things like this without just being that the person is just deranged. Because it is a yeah, complete yeah, waste has... of resources. Even, right? like, the whole Force Public must have been full of, like, maniacs. There's, like, there's no way, like, you can <laughs> exactly. say that just one person's deranged. If, if people yeah. were deranged, then the whole thing would have to be made up of deranged people. Like, I mean, just you the... don't just go, it's, it's not just like, you know, you, you, you're, like, before, before you go to sleep, you sort of take a drink and, like, Hey Bob, how many hands did you cut off last night? No. Actually, no. It would yeah. be more like Francois. How many hands was that? And then they'll be like, "We got a hundred boys." And then they ship it back to Belgium like big boys. I mean, it's just such a ridiculous system that they. Yeah. <sighs> Imagine just like, I don't even think I could bring myself to cut off someone's hand. Like, and they they live afterwards. That is just it is so sick. So, so it's not even like. You you getting it off like a dead body? I wonder if they thought it humane that they were just cutting the hands off and not killing them instead. Yeah, like yeah they were told I, I think to. that's probably. what they probably would have thought. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder um, if they just started cutting off both hands for like some of them. And maybe it's mm. not even the fact that they're deranged. Maybe that's how they just all thought and were taught to think. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because I guess a different time brought up different ways. Yeah. And of course, the European attitude to the Africans. Yeah, exactly. Subhuman. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. Well, all of the thing that Leopold was doing in the Congo actually did eventually get out with some publications from journalists who got the information out of what it was doing. This was right after the late um, 1890s to the early 1900s, the rubber boom, in which case Leopold just reaped in so much profit from people buying off rubber from the Congo, because it was a state monopoly, you know, he sold it, he, he sold it at such a low price to the popu- to the European powers, people just relied on him, and what ended up happening was British activists, mostly British human rights activists, formed formed the, um, the Congo Reform Association, the human rights group, eventually after an investigation and public, mass public outcry through media publications, the Belgian parliament forced Leopold's hand, annexing the, the Congo Free State on November the 15th, 1908. Although Leopold promised reforms, but at that time, people just wanted him to go. And the new colonial government, the Belgian Congo, um, ensured that the church, the state, and private companies oversaw the welfare of its inhabitants. Um, estimated, estimated damage from later sources, we don't really know how many people died, but due to, you know, just poor state of living in general, mass killings, and new epidemics brought by the Europeans. An estimated 50% of the Congo population, and upwards to 20 million, had perished during the reign of Leopold in mm. roughly 20 years. Hmm. Alright, should we move on to the Boer Wars? Yeah, sure. sure. We should move on to the Boer Wars. Alright, so just for like basic um, information... The, the Dutch were the first on the Cape, and I'm not exactly sure when they'd settled it, but they were there before anybody else. But to really paraphrase everything, the British grabbed a lot of Dutch possessions during the Napoleonic Wars, like Sri Lanka and South Africa, 
well, modern day South Africa, and that's how they got there. And the Boers are original, well, the, the descendants of the Dutch settlers living in South Africa. And yes. they were culturally and linguistically very different to the British, not really invaders, but just settlers now. And it led to a lot of um, disruptions and disputes between them. So they, um, the British and the Afrikaners signed the Sand River Convention in 1857, essentially Britain recognized the independence of um, the Orange uh, of the South African Republic, which was an, an Afrikaner country essentially, though it was somewhat aligned the Boer with Republics? Britain. Yeah, the the Boer states, but mainly the South African Republic. Yeah, and um, then um, just, just to be clear about the definition, we're going to refer to the South African Republic as Transvaal because that was the name of the region. They called it. They call it Transvaal, and this is to avoid confusion from the actual South African Republic or the Republic of South Africa. Sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, and then in 1886, um, there was a huge gold rush in the Orange Free State and Transvaal and the uh, Cape Colony, and it was actually somewhat in sync. I mean, in, in the same time as you know the California Gold Rush and even the Victorian Gold Rush in Australia, so mm -hmm. lots of gold being found. But uh, the British rushed into it pretty happily, like they always did when they found something that was worth something anywhere in the world. And as such, the Boer Republic started expanding into territories north of what the British officially controlled. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I, I kind of find I, I find it interesting these days how um, you see most of like South Africans these days and. While some of them have more British names, like the vast majority of like Afrikaners, like white South Africans, still have, you know, more Dutch kind of names. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I'm kind of like most of the names I've seen from South Africa are from cricket, but a lot of them, like all the white players all have like Dutch kind of names rather than anything remotely British. Just an interesting observation that the Afrikaners, I mean, obviously we, we're not going to touch on apartheid this time because it's a later topic and a different topic, yeah. but yeah, it, it, it's a bit interesting how the Afrikaners are still like the prevalent, you know, um, white race in South Africa. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, Peter, do you want to continue from there? Um, regarding the occupation of the Boer region? And what uh, happened? Yeah, yeah, how, how the, uh, the British tried to control the um, Orange Free State and everything. All right, so they approached them with, like, this treaty, right? With the Boer Republics, um, the two Boer Republics, they were independent states. And there was a, a, a Sand River Convention signed in the 17th of January, 1857, where the British recognized the independence of the Orange Free State and Transvaal. However, the British decided to pop down here to the two Boer Republics and propose a British Boer Federation similar to French English provinces in Canada. And of course the Boer leaders rejected the plan. And the successive British annexations in certain regions such as um West Gurkwala Gurkwala land made the Boer Republics uneasy about their British neighbors due to their expansionist policies. Um another problem was that the Boer states were stuck between the British and Kingdom of Zululand. Now, skirmishes broke out between the Boers, who were, we said, Dutch European descent, with the Zululand natives, and intensifying border conflicts with other tribes such as the Petty, led by bloody hell, um, Sekou Se 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 the first, yeah, um, over land and labor, and the Boers were able to were defeated due to the Petties and firepower. However, um. King Sechiwayu of the Zulus decided to rearm and expand their territory, meaning that making that the whole region sort of filled with tension regarding this upcoming war between the Zulus and the European descent. Um, the British suddenly came up with this special warrant and just annexed Transvaal. Although most people weren't really happy, they didn't really have a choice since they didn't want to fight the Zulus and didn't fight the British, or rather stick around with the British first to help take out the Zulus, who they perceived as the more immediate threat. And after a couple clashes, and a British ultimatum sent to Sechiwayu on the 11th of December, 1878, um, Transvaal was annexed, 1877, by the British. Um, 
The British invaded Zululand when Satyuayo didn't respond. However, Satyuayo, the king of Zululand, was aware of just what kind of war he was going to go into and put his troops on defensive position near the border where he said, don't attack unless you're provoked. Um, the British didn't want to go to war because this was just all too much effort for Zululand, but they had to because Satyuayo didn't respond to the ultimatum. And the British annexed Zululand on 4th of July, 1879 leading to rising nationalistic sentiment among the Transvaal people after the Zulus have been defeated, which calls for a revolt after a Boer, a, after a Boer citizen refused to pay taxes, and the British took his wagon to auction it off, but then there was a riot with 100 bras to disrupt the auction, leading to violence and escalating into a um, war. And Transvaal declared their independence on the 16th of December, 1880. This this event, the, the First Boer War, was very similar to the American independence or the American Revolution, where the Boers, um, where the Boer uprising were made up of civilian militias who were skilled hunters and cavalrymen. Um, the British were not trained for marksmanship, obviously they were unprepared. The British uniforms are also red, which means they stood out in the South African terrain. Um, they were also commanded by a commander called Sir George Pomeroy Colley. And right off the bat, the Boers decided to start sieging all of the British forts. And Colley's forces attempted to take back the garrisons and break through the Boer lines. Um, a lot of times, for example, in the Battle of Lang's Neck, um, Kali tried to free his garrisons from Boer attacks and was completely annihilated by the Boer forces. 84 British soldiers were killed with 113 wounded and two captured out of the 1,260 Boer troops. He rushed his soldiers against 2,000 Boer soldiers instead of waiting for reinforcements and were just decimated, completely destroyed. Um, another battle at Shun Hoot where Kali attempted to clear a path from Newcastle to Mount Prospect. Um, he was once again ambushed and attacked by the Boers, and encircled put into defensive positions. Um, thanks to a raid, thanks to rainfall, the Boers, the Boers were decided to retreat and continue the battle tomorrow. However, at that time, um, Kali had already left. The most decisive battle in the First Boer War was Majuba Hill, where Kali's 360 man overlook over Majuba Hill were found by the Boers who used accurate shooting and environmental position to drive out the British. This was a remarkable case. 92 soldiers died, and 92 soldiers died in the British forces against a single Boer soldier who was killed. An additional 134 British soldiers were wounded and 59 captured. The war, this battle at Majuba Hill was so bad to the British, they actually had to sign a truce, which granted the Transvaal region self-rule and eventual independence, which ended the First Boer War. Hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm re still honestly really impressed with how successful the Boers were at this point. Like, they were always sort of, you know, the natives who weren't really as armed or trained well armed or well trained as the british but like this just shows you i mean like what we were talking about last time in afghanistan if you know the terrain and it doesn't matter how well trained you are but it's so much more effective because as you can see the boars could just lay ambushes like we saw at uh, majuba hill and and all these other places and it was so much more effective than the british who had no idea what they were doing yeah and the fact that the Boers had the support of the population while well, the British didn't, and they yeah, weren't yeah. as trained. I mean, it's insane to think about. Like, the British were professional soldiers going up against a bunch of hunters and sort of just marksmen who just lived off the land, and how yeah. much of a difference that could make, like, day to day practice. Exactly. Now, this yeah. was the first time since the American Revolution where the British had to sign a treaty that was against them. This was one of the very few times in the First Boer War where the British had lost against 
native forces or any. Oh, hold on, Peter, forces. one second. Can we also point out that um, George Pomeroy Colley was actually killed at Majuba Hill as well? Oh, he was? Like, that's how was. bad the defeat was. Yeah, he actually got killed in Majuba Hill. Wow. Like, that's how big the implosion was from the British. Maybe that's why they had to start sign up the, um, the end to sign the truce because, oh, look, our commander's dead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, pretty much. Um, All right, are we going to talk about Cecil Rhodes, Peter? Yeah, um, Cecil, about Cecil Rhodes and what happened with the Second World War was that as time went on after the First World War ended in pretty much 1881, no, wait, not, not, yeah, 1881, um, around 1881, um, Cecil Rhodes, who ruled the Cape Colony, which was modern day pretty much South Africa, um, the, the resource boom and the gold rush around the Transvaal and the Boer regions led to a huge influx of outlanders to, to Transvaal as they didn't have the manpower or the resources to exploit it. What ended up happening was the outlander population became larger than the Boer one, but it didn't have things like voting rights. So the British demanded full voting rights for the outlanders, but were rejected. Um, Cecil Rhodes and his expansionist policies obviously wanted to take control of the Transvaal region and its resources. So what happened was that the British tried to um, to arouse an uprising through the Jamerson raid, an uprising by the Outlanders to spark a civil war and use that as a way to intervene into um, the Transvaal region, in which case the Outlanders obviously give British favorable policies. However, that didn't help. So what happened was that... Um, this uprising and the conflict regarding the natives, regarding uh, regarding the natives, right, were led to the British invasion of the Boer territories. Initially, once again, the Boer decided to organize civilian militias and immediately went ahead and started sieging three targets, Lady Smith, um, Maitha King, and Kimberley. However, unlike the previous one, this was a protracted war and the Boer offensive and the, um, the Boer offensive, really, the British were ready for the Boer offensive, so they held off for a bit. And what ended up happening was the British sent a colossal amount of troops into the Transvaal and the Orange Free State region, the Boer regions. By the time the reinforcements arrived, they were able to relieve these towns, and the Boers realized they were just out, literally outnumbered. And after they realized that what happened, one of the Boers' major generals, Piet Conge, um, surrendered with 400 soldiers, all of the Boer front just collapsed. There were no morale. The British were able to sweep through the Boer regions with little resistance. Um, the Orange Free State was annexed the 28th of May um, 1900, with war beginning on October 11th, 1899. And Pretoria, the, um, the capital of Transvaal, was captured after the Boers just gave up on the 5th of June, 1900, and Transvaal was annexed on the 1st of September, 1900. Um, this led to a guerrilla warfare phase where the Boers retreated back into the terrain and took over all of the land that wasn't physically occupied by the British soldier. Um, this, was, this was initially effective since the British had to once again adjust their policies to the Boers. But once they did so, the British began building blockhouses to parcel up regions of land and use sweeping squads to slowly move through the country. Um, the British also decided to use scorched earth and concentration camps to keep the population in check and destroy any resources to assist the Boers, which once again led to mass deaths due to the poor, um, due to the lack of resources, thanks to the scorched earth policies, as well as the poor state of the concentration camps. Eventually, last the last of the Boers surrendered in the early to mid 1900s, and the British were able to solidify their rule over Transvaal and the Boer republics. Hmm. The Boers are a pretty interesting part of like history because it shows like we we we, to we talk a lot about the conflict between the Europeans and the Africans. There yeah. are also cases where there's conflict between Europeans and Europeans, like. The, those Dutch are of the Orange and Transvaal, you know, settlers have been there for quite yes. a while, and like you know, to the point where they could they consider it their like home country. 
not just a colony. And then like you see the conflict between Europeans and Europeans in this regard. Which also is with the with the um the settlers, the Americans as well. Yeah, and we see like it, an effect this has had on South Africa today because like didn't they um didn't they like private um sorry publicize you know make make public a lot of their farms owned by white settlers at yeah they're point, doing right? that now yeah. to redistribute everything which is like you know i mean i can i can sort of see why they do it but then again like Dutch what people the white there people did it as well yeah but anyway, it, it yeah. The, the, the boer wars were it's a cornerstone of south african history this was pretty much their american independence war the first boer war yeah. and the occupation and the and occupation it's important, that, it's important that people don't forget the fact that the dutch were there first and they actually had a huge effect on like yeah you know, even the language afrikaans which is like germanic isn't it i'm pretty sure isn't it yeah basically yeah anyway well we're um, moving on now to the um final the morocco, crisis, right? the morocco crisis yeah will do you want to take it um i thought you would peter Oh, yeah, sure. So the first Morocco crisis was almost the last stage of um, the scrum for Africa, which led into, which pretty much led into the, the First World War. Um, the French in 1904 had a secret treaty with Spain on partitioning the region of Morocco, the Sultan of Morocco, and agreed not to oppose Britain and whatever the British was doing in Egypt. However, Kaiser Wilhelm II decided to just pop over to Morocco conferred with the sultan and proceeded to tour the city on his horse before guaranteeing the independence of Morocco. Now, this <laughs> obviously was meant to piss off the French a lot, and the French got pissed off quite a lot. Yeah. So the French decided to give the, um, the Moroccans a series of government reforms, which the Moroccans rejected. And then the Sultan of Morocco proposed to open his own conference where other countries that weren't the French or not only the French would give him advice on how to reform his country. And yeah. Germany was obviously supporting the Moroccans so that the French could be called into account before the European powers. However, the French foreign minister said, took a defiant line and said that the conference was not needed. Meanwhile, the German chancellor just decided to actually threaten war with the French if the French didn't come to the Moroccan conference. To France be honest, canceled... with, that, with, with the Germans, that, that, that's just childish, to be blunt. It is. You know, like, well, it's, it's an ex I think I mean, a lot yes, of they're defending like their interests, but it's like, okay, we'll invade you if you don't turn up to the conference that we're forcing everybody to go to. By just yeah, sticking like, it up. I wouldn't call that yeah. childish, because like, uh, I mean, you see plenty of European powers do that. With um, it's, so it's like smart diplomacy. They, they're basically designing to piss off their main rival. Which is yeah, but I mean, if we do. honestly look at it, it's 1904, and you'd expect everyone to have grown up by this point. And essentially, <laughs> well, I mean, look at the world China. today. Yeah, I mean, but... China still exists in 1904. Don't... Yeah, but I mean, essentially, yeah, you'd it. expect this kind of stuff, you know, during the Renaissance, but not like, oh, we'll invade you if you don't pop up to our thing. I mean, I guess there's a reason behind it, but it's like, you know, do they really need to declare war over it? Oh, it's Morocco. It, I then. honestly don't think they would have. I think it was just more of a bluff. Or even, yeah, although to be fair, I think the Germans might have been looking for an, maybe another excuse to yeah. maybe go to, and then this gives them less That's what I really see of it. I don't. I think they just want to challenge the French again. Yeah, yeah I mean, because they won. Like their really colonial well. empire wasn't even big when compared to the French. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, the French just had a lot of desert. But obviously, yeah. they were. I mean. The Germans were looking for some way to expand, especially with yeah. the, uh, the the character of Kaiser Wilhelm, and you know. Yeah, I just want to say I don't think I don't think you can write it off as childish. There's definitely like motive behind it. And... Yeah, but it was quite a blunt move. I think to, that's yeah, what yeah, Wilhelm was in getting at. That I I think it. To be really honest, what I mean, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, sure, but I I yeah, think yeah, that's yeah. like, you know, really not needed, and it's kind of like you know. <laughs> There are so many ways you can do it rather than just being like, okay, we're going to th threaten, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives by having two superpowers in Europe yeah. go to war, even if the Germans aren't, you know, going to back up their words. Just like warmongering rhetoric is always just silly and needless, to be honest. Yeah, um, but that's like a very modern view on it, to be fair. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, well, let's, let's, let's like, get back to um, 
I guess we should get back. Let's not forget there was an arms race between Germany and France, Britain, and Russia. This was not a good time for a huge war over Morocco. Yeah, I mean, mm. you can see, um, like, World War French, I is evidence for that. Yeah. The French um, cancelled all military leave on the 15th of June, and Germany threatened to sign a defensive pact with the Sultan on June 22nd. Um, the French foreign minister, who decided to go to the conference, um, resigned as France no longer supported his policy since the French didn't even want a war with Germany, and France agreed to attend the conference on July 1st. Although the... Um, the the Algeciras um, conference was supposed to solve a lot of problems. The crisis mounted up until the eve of the conference on December 30th, where Germany caught up its reserve unit and the French moved troops into the border on Alsace. Um, so why did Germany call for this conference? Well, Kaiser Wilhelm was looking for a way to weaken the British, sort of the British-French alliance and expand his own ambitions. Um, he had hoped that the Russo-Japanese War and the 1905 Revolution in Russia would make the Russians hungry for an ally. However, the British supported the French, especially during the crisis, and unlike what the Germans had felt, this actually made the Entente stronger as opposed to weaker, since the British would realize that the Germans were going to become an actual threat. Um, Germany also decided to fuel the Anglo-German naval race by passing the third naval law that added five extra-large cruisers for the foreign fleet, one extra-large cruiser in material reserve, and four the torpedo boats. The Germans were ready to oppose the yeah. oppose the um the the Entente, although sort of backfired on them because the crisis made turn. In the actual conference, um. Morocco had to make concessions to European bankers with its new central bank, the strict the Bank of uh, Morocco. Um, they issued gold-backed banknotes. The uh, the state bank obviously had administrators who guaranteed loans to Germany, UK, France, and Spain. Um, Europeans could now own land in Morocco. Um, the Sultan had Muslim police in six cities, but they would be instructed by French and Spanish officers who oversaw the paymaster for, for these troops. And the inspector general was Swiss. Um, Although the Morocco delegates found it impossible to sign the um the final act, the Sultan was able to ratify it later in in a decree, and the Morocco crisis deepened deepened the divide regarding um Germany and the British. Yeah, mm. I mean to be honest, the fact that it backfired kind of badly into the Germans' favor is I mean I kind of feel to be honest that yes sure they're an upcoming power and yes they just defeated the french but if they really want to become you know the power of europe they kind of have to slip under the radar and they gradually build up to a point where nobody can stop them but yeah if they kind of like you know they sh- they force their hand too early by um you know mm-hmm. i think the germans got like the big boys too cocky. and they couldn't you know back up their words in a way i think i think they got too cocky because they won the franco prussian and then they had, then they were like swelled up in this huge like German nationalism, and we can do everything. And then yeah. the Berlin Conference gave them a lot of land, and then you see this very very fast rise from a band of disunited states or barely united states to a, an empire. And then they would have gotten like drunk on that power almost, and then just sort of like push forward and try and get more and more and more, which ultimately led to their downfall. It, it's absolutely. Exactly ironic to see the Kaiser's Kaiser Wilhelm II's policy to just start almost Zerg rushing with the um with their expansion and just sticking it up to the British yeah. every turn. When just a generation ago Bismarck's policy was with careful diplomacy to keep a balance yeah. between Britain, French and um Britain um and France and Germany and to see all of that just go to waste with the Morocco conflict exactly. all of that is quite interesting. If you want to hear more about German unification and Bismarck Check out the uh, previous episode that we did on that, where we talked about that. And I think I think it shows you just it puts into perspective just how great Bismarck was at political maneuvering because the fact that you know Kaiser Wilhelm II wasn't I don't think he was too bad I don't think he was a bad Kaiser, but the fact that like you, it's so it's like Bismarck was so much greater yeah. just shows like how you know amazing it he was as, like a chancellor. The Kaiser was unbelievably cocky. Yeah, he was. Yeah. And, that's, and I feel like it just erased all of the good work that Bismarck had done. I think that links was, to like King Leopold in a way, because King Leopold II in a way, because like 
both of these people raised raised you know with the expectance of being given what they want and then they yeah. go and take it for themselves like you know hmm. Hmm. i mean i just yeah, think yeah. that if germany had been a bit more subtle Care? yeah and careful with how they'd acted rather than just saying you know we we'll, we're going to go to war with you france and then i mean to be blunt at this point there is no way germany is going to beat france and britain together no. so i think they were kind of playing with fire in the sense that they didn't you know really fully take into account the fact that you know if they didn't back up well i mean if they did back up their words and go to war they would be trashed and if they didn't back up their words they'd have to back down so yeah i think it's kind of like playing with fire and not realizing that fire is hot by germany yeah yeah that's true and um, we're, we're gonna just quickly wrap up here with the scrum for africa it's interesting to see how you know the exploits of one single of a couple explorers and missionaries the other day led to massive atrocities under the congo free state um yeah. obviously you can argue the congo free state in the early of um, the first few years of the 20th century so sort of put in the seed in which case led to the decolonization after world war ii due to them mm. realizing just the atrocities yeah. that occurred of course later of the morocco crisis we can see the scramble for africa was actually one of the main instigators for world war one due to kaiser's own unwillingness to challenge the british during the col colo during this colonial which is why it's called the scrap of africa you know all of these european countries are grabbing up land in africa in such a short amount of time mm. um just on a side note um sorry if there's like some audio problems with like cam's mic um because his cat is just screwing around i don't know what's <laughs> happening but cam has messaged us multiple times saying that his cat is causing uh, um mayhem i quote my cat is flipping out um cat gone mad and um yeah so sorry about the cat um anyways i'm back on track um anything else you guys want to say before we wrap up no, just saying thank you for watching and listening, and we'll see you next week.